Well, General, we normally take questions at the end of the presentation, but we don't have time because we want to spend more time with you. So it's incumbent upon me to ask the most important question. So I'll start with the most important question first, and that is, is the National Security Council really the ultimate backdoor into Stanford? <laughs> Hey, well, I'm just going to paraphrase David Brooks, who says, I only teach at institutions that I could have not have gotten into. <laughs> <laughs> Given your illustrious military career, your academic career, your policy career, uh, what was more daunting and gut-wrenching, uh, cresting a hill in the Middle East to find more Iraqi tanks in front of you than you had with you at the time? or sitting on that couch in 2017 next to President Trump, having accepted a job that repeatedly people had passed over and looking at all the media at that time. Uh, how did you feel? Well, you know, I, I, I felt grateful for the opportunity to continue serving. In, in many ways, uh, the, the, my duties and responsibilities as assistant to the president for national security was a bonus round for me, right? I had served in the Army by that time for you know, 33 years, and I was on a path to retiring from, from the Army, wasn't sure what we were going to do, so it really came out of the blue. But then, as I had you know, at least a few moments to reflect on my career, I was very grateful for, I think, many opportunities that help prepare somebody as much as anybody can be prepared for a job of such broad scope and responsibility. So uh, you know, I, I, I think that I really had an opportunity to make good on some of the criticisms maybe that I held uh, about the direction that our foreign policy, our national security strategy had taken in, in recent years. I, I felt as if you know, we, we had been complacent and overconfident in the post-Cold War period, and that overconfidence had somehow shifted to really pessimism, almost defeatism. And as a military officer, what's the primary motivation here? Is it more your kind of supreme can-do confidence, having been thrown a lot of other challenges and having to figure it out and accomplish the mission? Or was it kind of an intense sense of patriotism knowing where the country was at the time? Well, I, I just think that any opportunity to serve is a privilege. You know, and, and I think that maybe sometimes in our society today, we tend to look at service in the military through, uh, I think, the, the lens of popular culture. And I think these days, popular culture tends to cheapen and coarsen uh, military service and the, and the warrior ethos in, in particular. And, and what service in our military, what service in our intelligence agencies, in our government broadly, gives you an opportunity to do is to be part of something bigger than yourself and to be part of a team in our military in which the man or woman next to you is willing to give everything, including their own lives for you. And so I think that there are these less tangible rewards that it's difficult for people, to, that are difficult for people to see. I think across the political spectrum, people felt somewhat surprised but glad there were three generals on duty at the time. Uh, but anybody's worked with the military in the last decade or two has seen how much more competent the military overall, and especially the senior military leaders have become? Well, I think the most important skills that I, I was able to bring to this job, I think, was, was mainly the gift I'd been given by the Army to, as my full-time job, read, think, study, discuss, and write about history. And, and the topic that I chose turned out to be quite relevant, which was a topic that involved national security decision-making uh, in, in time of, of war. How much of that goes back to this book, Dereliction of Duty, that you wrote, that you studied what went wrong during the LBJ administration? And if I understand it correctly, one of your biggest complaints was how the military was marginalized, how they didn't really have a seat at the table, and the president really wasn't getting the full assessment from a military perspective. As you saw that the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Joe Dunford, was not represented yeah. at the table, was that very obvious to you that you had to correct that? Yeah, it, it was. And, and the reason for this is that I cannot think of a historical example in which giving a president fewer perspectives or fewer options right, was, was better than giving a president more perspectives and more options. And, and, uh, and, and I think that, that the president deserves best military advice. And, 
And, uh, and so the period that I wrote about, during the period I wrote about, the, the, real, the, the, the real problems had to do with, first of all, uh, a compromise essentially of principle for expediency in which the president's top civilian and military advisors decided, hey, it was, it was better to tell the president what the president wanted to hear. And then over time, really argue for the kinds of decisions and resources and a strategy that, was, that, that they felt was required at the outset to, to address the, the, the problem set in, in, in Vietnam. And so Secretary McNamara develops a strategy for the war based on the president's desire to keep Vietnam on the back burner. And so by doing so, again, it masked any kind of discussion of long-term costs and consequences. It prevented the discussion of other options. And actually, it aided and abetted the president's effort to circumvent the Constitution of the United States and deny the American people, or at least the representatives in Congress, a say in decisions that involved you know, life and death, right? And, and, and so, so I brought to the job really a determination to provide the president with multiple options and the best analysis and advice possible. Speaking of process and these groups that you've defined here, one of the first challenges of your process seemed to try to get the Joint Chiefs of Staff back at the table, having been replaced by political appointees, Steve Bannon and others. How tough of a fight was that? So I thought it was important to communicate to the American people that, that domestic political considerations were not primary when we were talking about national security and, and foreign affairs re related decisions. And so, uh, so Mr. Bannon's predecessors had not been on that permanent committee. And so the, the, my recommendation was that, that we, you know, we model uh, the, the, you know, the, that, that committee uh, based on, on really what its purpose is. I think there are three types of people who serve in any administration. And there are those who are there to serve the president and the country. And, and they see it in, this, in the context of a national security advisor job, for example, of presenting options to the president, recognizing that, hey, the American people elected the president. And so, and so it's your job to present options and then to assist with the execution of that president's decisions. I think there's a second group of people who serve, in, again, in any administration, and these are people who are there maybe not necessarily to serve the president, uh, but they're there to serve their own agendas. And, and rather than give that president options, what they would prefer to do is try to manipulate decisions to get outcomes consistent with their agenda, again, not the president's agenda. And then I think there sometimes is a third group of, uh, of people who sort of cast themselves in the role of saving the country, you know, or maybe the world from the president, right? And so, so, the, so, <laughs> but so I, I think I think that really the only true motivation is is that first group, because the second group and the third group are actually undermining the Constitution of the United States. What were the big lessons you learned from researching the book and studying that period? Uh, if there was a mantra that you had to take into your job now in 2017, what were the cardinal rules or cardinal sins that you had to avoid? Uh, I think the first is to, to ensure that you know, you're giving the president the benefit, not just of like, your opinion right, or your advice, you know, as if you're some oracle, but to run a process that gives the president access to the best advice and analysis across our departments and agencies, but, but when necessary, from the private sector, from academia. And, and, and so, so that was the first, I think the first aspect of the job. Sounds like a great plan. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> it was so, like clockwork. Like clockwork. clockwork. Yeah, where they say <laughs> the, the enemy always has a vote on any plan. All right, so you, you cross the line of departure, game on. So as this things start to transpire now, uh, how much of that process uh, were you able to maintain? Any big organization, as all of you, I'm sure, know, is not without friction and difficult you know, personalities and relationships and so forth. But, but I really thought our team did a very good job of keeping our eye on that mission. And so what did we do? We went from strategic patience on North Korea to maximum pressure. Well, we'll see how that plays out. We might talk about that. We went from you know, kind of a, 
a policy of strategic engagement, a pretty, a pretty passive approach uh, to, to, the, to the aggressive uh, policies of the Chinese Communist Party uh, to a, a policy of, of competition, right? And I, I mean, not, not on a, I think the, as, a, as the best way to avoid confrontation, we have to be able to compete effectively uh, and, and, and counter Chinese unfair trade and economic practices, the sustained campaign of industrial espionage that they've been waging against us, uh, the, the military aggression uh, that we see in the, in the South China Sea, their use of co-option and coercion uh, in, this, in this sort of debt trap uh, associated with this One Belt, One Road initiative. So that, that was a, a really, I think, a multi-generational shift in, in policy uh, that, that was required you know, based on the, the policies and actions of the Chinese Communist Party and its leadership. On Russia, we put in a strategy to counter Russian uh, really sustained campaign of, of political subversion, disinformation and propaganda against the West. And you know, of course, this is the biggest topic of conversation uh, in, our, in our country about the degree to which the administration has been committed to it. But I think if you look at the actions that, that occurred uh, you know, to really counter this, this pernicious form of, I think, political warfare against us, uh, you know, we, took, we took it very seriously and put a policy in place. As a Lieutenant General and as a National Security Advisor, where was your ultimate loyalty? To the president or to the Constitution and the Congress? Well, it's clear to the Constitution of the United States, right? I mean, so that's what's different uh, about us is that, is that we, nobody, nobody swears allegiance to a king or a president, right? All of us who are sworn into federal office across all departments and agencies are sworn to support the Constitution of the United States. And, and, um, and so... Uh, you know, your duties and responsibilities must always be seen as consistent with that service to the, to the Constitution. General, thank you for your service on the battlefield and inside the Beltway. Thanks. Thank you.